Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is the Gospel reading from Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 33 that Jim read just a few moments ago. And we are going to talk about the, the entirety of the text because I think they relate, even though they're two different stories that we sometimes tell in Sunday school in two completely different ways. But this follows on the coattails of talking about parables. So let's do a little bit of a reminder, a recap. What is a parable? Jesus was teaching in parables. And last week's text, I believe, said something about how he didn't do any teaching without a parable because he was trying to help people understand. So what's a parable? Yep. An earthly story with a, heaven, with a heavenly meaning. So Jesus was trying to teach about what the kingdom of heaven was like, and he used earthly stories to do that. So he, he did that, but, uh, and I would say those stories, I don't know where he got them from. Maybe they were stories that he picked up along the way, so they might have been other stories that his parents told him. Maybe they were stories that he just made up in order to explain what the kingdom of heaven is like. But this week, he's not doing the same kind of teaching, but he's still teaching. He's using what I'm going to call concrete life situations and just not using the, the parable structure. In the first example, the first story, Jesus multiplies the bread and the fish. He takes a finite number of something. How many loaves? How many fish? Okay, good, you can see, that's good. And turns, it, turns that finite number of something into something more producing, more, producing enough food for everyone present. And the text says that there were 5,000 uh, men plus women and children. So we don't know exactly how many were following, but there's a lot of people. I remember when I read this again, I remember watching Jesus of Nazareth. I don't know what, when, when that movie was produced, but whenever I read this text, I have this vision of, of white Jesus sitting there surrounded by his disciples, and he, he's kind of ignoring everybody, but they come, to up, come up to him with the problem, and there's, there's no food, and he, kinda, he sits there like this. I don't know which hand it was. Maybe this hand. And it's kind of shaking like this, like he's thinking, he's meditating, he's drawing on some kind of power. But eventually, he gets to the point where he is, it's obvious that he's praying. The disciples have to, to hand out the fish and the bread, and they're like, there's not enough. And yes, there are. Look, there's a whole basket full of fish, and they're, they're take, taking these whole fish out of the basket. I don't know what they're going to do with whole fish. Probably the same thing they did with whole quail in the Old Testament. But they take these fish out, and if, at some point they dump the basket out, and there's just fish are all, all over the place. They don't, you don't see him eating the fish in the movie. You see him scarfing down the bread, not the fish, but this vision of, of whole fish being dumped out and having so much that, uh, that they have 12 baskets left over. And the point here uh, is that in the movie, the people are, are holding the bread, holding the fish, and admiring them, wondering where they came from, being impressed with the whole process. But the message here is that the Lord provides. Something as simple as, as basic nutrition for people who were hungry. Maybe not starving, but hungry. The Lord provides. In the second example, Jesus walked on water. And in this account, the wind that was plaguing the boat, this one doesn't have the word storm associated with it, but there's wind and there are waves. So the wind calms down coincidentally with Peter and Jesus getting into the boat. But in Matthew 8, there's another story that's very similar where Jesus actually speaks to the winds and the, and the sea and it says, there was a great calm. And in both cases, the disciples are amazed at Jesus' power. Whether he speaks words to the wind and waves or not, they attribute the calming to Jesus. And they're amazed at his power. In Matthew 8, they say, What sort of man is this that even winds and sea obey him? And being six chapters later, having some presumption that there's some time has passed, and they're in a very similar situation, uh, in our text in Matthew 14, they say, truly you are the Son of God. 
and maybe they learned about what sort of man this was in the meantime in between boat and storm incidents. And in both of these examples, there are people struggling even though Jesus is present and paying attention. He is there teaching and uh, ministering to the crowds, the 5,000, and he is there in the midst of the storm on the sea. And perhaps he's hungry in the, in the first example. The disciples are hungry. The people are hungry. It's basically a mess of a situation, and Jesus is still teaching when he says, you give them something to eat. The disciples don't know what to do, and the people are still hungry. And what we read in just a few short verses was probably a bit more drawn out in real time. So that the cr whole crowd is frustrated by the time Jesus ta finally takes charge and says, bring them here to me, the loaves and the fishes. I'll deal with this. But he takes the time, even at that moment, even in the midst of hunger and frustration and the crowds are getting a little wild perhaps, he takes the time to sit and pray. And then, tell me what's wrong with this next statement, and then Jesus fed the people. What's wrong with that statement? Is that what happens next? What happens next? What's wrong with that? Okay, so he did the prayer, but I'm saying after that, I'm saying it's wrong to say, then Jesus fed the people. What happened next? What's that? Okay, he broke the bread. He may very well have done that, but the next phrase, okay, he tells them, he tells his disciples to feed the crowd. Okay? So the text says, and the disciples gave them to the crowd. The disciples had a responsibility in this thing. Yes, Jesus was fully responsible for the miracle. The disciples don't have supernatural power on their own, but Jesus is teaching here. They had to rely on Jesus to have this abundance of bread and fish, but they had responsibility to distribute it to those who were hungry. So Jesus is teaching here. Jesus didn't throw up his hands like his students were idiots, like we don't know what to do next. He taught them. He equipped them. You do it. And along the way, if we're reading this story, you might think that, that Jesus is um, a, bit, a, a bit manipulative because he lets them get frustrated first. Like, why is he even letting them endure this? Why doesn't he take away the problem? He lets them get frustrated first. He let them see how futile their situation was, that they couldn't feed the crowds on their own. He let them see all that before stepping in and reminding them of the partnership this kingdom of heaven thing was to be. When the disciples are out on the water, did you catch the part where Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go to the other side? Those were the words. He made them go, he made, the, made them get into the boat. He sets them up here again. If we thought that he was being a little bit sneaky with the loaves and fishes, get into the boat, dudes. He set them up for another lesson, and it's another one that they wouldn't soon forget. The Sea of Galilee, which is the body of water that the boat sets out on, was known for sudden storms. And this night did not spare them from high winds and dangerous waves. I said before that the hungry crowd of people was, was a mess, leaving the disciples wondering what to do. But in that case, they went from wondering what to do on dry ground to being completely terrified on water. And that's when Jesus finally takes action here. Once again, he gives them a task. So feed the people, go out on the boat. He gives them a task, task, task lets them wrestle with it. Then he prays. We have the prayer before he distributes the bread and the fish. And before he goes out to the disciples on the water, he's taken some time to pray. Prayer is involved in this. 
and then he acts. There's a bit of a formula for how Jesus is teaching his disciples here. Gives them a task, lets them wrestle with it, he prays, so he talks to his father, and then he acts, knowing that his disciples need his help. He walks out to the disciples in the boat as if he were on dry ground, and then, tell me what's wrong with this next statement, then Jesus calms the wind and the waves. What's wrong with that? What? Well, it's in the Bible, kind of, but it's not the next thing. It's in the Bible somewhere. But he doesn't do that here. What does he, what do, what does he do next? Okay. I'm hearing, I'm hearing uncertainty is what I'm hearing, so that's okay. Uh, so he doesn't calm the wind and waves next. He doesn't do that. He lets them keep going on all around the boat. Jesus walks out. Peter steps out of the boat while the wind and the waves are still going to town. Even while he steps out of the boat and starts walking on the water, the stuff is still going crazy. So Jesus doesn't calm the waves, but he does speak the impossible words, the seemingly impossible words in the situation. He says, take heart, do not be afraid. Guess what? There's something wrong with that too. Does Jesus say, take heart, do not be afraid? Yes, but there's something missing in the midst of all that. I left out the main part, or what I would call the main part. The text actually says, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Hang on that just for a moment. Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. We're going to break that down just a little bit. First, the phrase, do not be afraid. This is just kind of the the side teaching moment here. Uh, That phrase in the Greek is me phobesthe. Not that that matters to you too much. Me phobesthe. It actually carries the weight of forbidding the continuance of being afraid. Like, stop that, not a word of encouragement. You may not be afraid anymore. It's kind of like... Uh, you're trying to go to a nightclub and the bouncer kicks you out? I don't know what that's like. None of you are relating. How about this? Um, Where you go to grandma's house and it's time for dinner and she doesn't let you get up from the table until you've eaten all the food. Does that sound more familiar? Okay. So that's more the the forbidding. Uh, She forbids you to get up from the table until you've eaten pretty much everything that's, that's in the refrigerator. Okay. It's a forbidding sort of thing. You do not be afraid. Me phobes they. But the main thing is the focus on it is, it is I. The difference between being in danger and being safe isn't the presence of fear or absence of it. It's the presence of Jesus in the midst of the raging waves. It's the fact that Jesus, the rabbi, the teacher, was right there that makes Peter bold enough to step out of the boat. He sees this guy that he has grown to trust. And so he, goes, he asks Jesus to ask him to come out to him on the, on the water. And this whole being bold enough to step out of the boat sounds ridiculous, like it's not something that you would choose to do or, or ask of your favorite teacher in any way. Uh, Help me to to do this thing. But that is what disciples do. Disciples emulate their teacher. And if their teacher, their rabbi, Jesus, was walking on water, well then by golly, that's what they ought to be doing too. They don't want to know just what the teacher knows. They don't want to know just, you know, teach me about the kingdom of heaven. What's it like? So now they've got this knowledge stored up in their brain and they can retell that story They want to be like their teacher, to do what the teacher does. If the rabbi walks on water, then so does the disciple. So Peter figures, my teacher's doing this, I should too. I told a a friend of mine this week that that we, Michelle Michelle and I, have a chance to teach our kids something about life in a broken home. And, uh, yeah, I worded it that way on purpose. Our, 
Uh, we don't have a, if you say a broken home, you're really talking about breakdown of family, and that's not what we're experiencing at this moment. But our home has had difficulty. You've heard the, 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 the struggle, the saga over the weeks, months, years. <laughs> okay. And in the midst of all this, we can say, hey, this is our home. We can say that it provides shelter. It provides warmth, except for the time that the, the boiler went out. It is a place for us to be together. And generally speaking, it's a place where we can be or feel safe. After a long day, you come home and it feels like home. You've been around people too much, you escape and you get to go home. And so in those respects, this is all part of God's provision. This Excuse me. The alternative is to constantly complain about the things that aren't working right. Teaching them, teaching our children that we're entitled to everything working correctly all the time, which I would suggest is a big lie and leads to disappointment. The friend then referred to my house as a, get this, a spiritual university which is much more credit than I'm willing to give our house, <laughs> I have to say. That, that's true. But it's a learning, a, a learning environment. Even though I'd rather it just be a house, it's a learning environment, and it's not just learning about life. It is teaching spiritual truths. So when we have Jesus teaching in parables, they're, they're the words. It's like this, it's like this. And again, it's, it's knowledge that goes in. But when Jesus shifts gears and he leads them into life examples, things that affect their person, hunger, thirst, frustration, uh, fear, terror, uh, trying to consider the unknown, when all those things are part of the learning experience, it's something that you don't soon forget it's something that affects you on more than just a physical level or even a mental level. It affects you on a spiritual one. And so the house in my situation, I, I would agree, it is a spiritual university. And so was the hillside for those 5,000 and his disciple and Jesus' disciples, and so was the sea and the boat. You've each got situations that are worthy of grumbling, of frustration, fear, or just plain wondering what's going to happen next. You've got those things. And God is probably going to let you wrestle with it for a little while, and maybe he's been letting you wrestle with it. The struggle is going to be there, but you're going to go through that time. You're going to wrestle. You're going to pray and those two things, they're not, they're not part of a formula for making everything better for you, but it's a plan for growing the kingdom. As God grows you spiritually, preparing you for something else. And you'd think that Jesus would have taken it easy on his disciples when they were new to following him. Like that Matthew 8 example they were relatively new in the, the arc of the Gospel of Matthew. But he just threw them right in to the deep end. Literally, almost. He threw them right in because that's where the people are. There's no amount of holy talk that I can offer to you. I can tell you the story about my house and about my, any number of things that are happening to me or going wrong or whatever. Um, and I can spiritualize it. I can make it holier or make it sound like I'm more holy than I really am and how I address these things. But I'm telling you I get frustrated with those things because, because you get frustrated with those things. Jesus throws his disciples into the deep end because that's where the people are. And you all experience these things, the frustration, the wondering, the questioning, the fear. And so Jesus gives us these stories, these examples, because they're relatable. Your struggles are relatable. May your prayers be likewise.
And may your actions toward others be loving as you seek to be like your rabbi. Your rabbi who desires to live in a relationship with people in the highs and in the lows, in the times of hunger and in times of satisfaction, in times of fear and in times of peace. In the name and the spirit of Jesus, amen.